The sun itself travels about the core of the Milky Way galaxy. Our galaxy is moving among the other galaxies. We have always been space travelers. These fine sand grains are all more or less uniform in size. They've been produced from bigger rocks through ages of jostling and rubbing, abrasion and erosion, driven in part by the distant moon and sun. So the roots of the present lie buried in the past. We are also travelers in time. Now, over the first few billion years of the cosmos, now that we've got matter ready to do something interesting, electrons are bound to the atoms, we're ready to start building the cosmos. And in those first few billion years, galaxies were manufactured. The Milky Way was one of them. Our Milky Way was one of them. How many galaxies were made? Somewhere between 50 and 100 billion galaxies, each containing up to 100 billion stars, each of those stars undergoing thermonuclear fusion in their cores. There are stars that more, with more than about 10 times the mass of the sun. They're very special in the evolution of the universe because they have enough mass to create enough pressure, to create enough temperature to turn their cores into a factory, an element factory. They manufacture dozens of elements over their lifetime, beyond the birth elements from the Big Bang, beyond hydrogen and helium and the little bit of lithium. These stars make the elements that we are composed of. They make the carbon and the nitrogen and the oxygen and the iron. They undergo thermonuclear fusion to do that. Thermo uses heat. Nuclear, what are you doing with the nucleus? Fusion, you're bringing them together. The anatomy of that word. Actually, so what if the star just made the elements? They're no good inside the star. We've got to get them out of the star somehow. Turns out, those stars explode. They blow their guts to smithereens in the galaxy. At the end of their lives, that's how they die. They're visible. We see them. We call them supernovae. So fortunately, their chemical enrichment is now returned. Not returned, it was manufactured there for the first time and is now distributed across the galaxy. In fact, the universe might view it as pollution. But since we're made of the stuff, I think of it as enrichment. The Earth is about 4.6 billion years old. 4.6 thousand million years old. The first replicating systems emerged about 4 billion years ago. Following those first replicators came the first bacterial-like cells. And if you go to Western Australia, you can see in Shark Bay stromatolites that contain these first bacteria 3.5 billion years old. After this, came the eukaryotic cells, very simple to begin with. These eukaryotic cells arose as a consequence of the engulfment of a bacterial-like cell by the ancestral eukaryote cell. And evidence of that exists today in our own cells. The mitochondria that are the powerhouses of our cells were once free-living bacteria. And so you have ancient bacteria living in you. And, and they can't be taken apart anymore. We can't get rid of them because they're essential to our metabolism and they can't live without us. And then there are bacteria. Uh, all of you have, at the present moment, about four to six pounds of bacteria in your guts alone. There are ten times more bacterial cells in your body than there are of your own cells. So who is a single organism? I mean, are you just carrying them around the world? Because you don't have as many cells in your body that with your DNA as they do. Some of them are essential for your life. You can't live without them. And some of them, of course, turn nasty and can kill you. And, the, and whichever they can do depends upon your present state of health and the vaccinations you had as a child. And then there are viruses. 
So if there are 10 times more bacterial cells in your body than there are your own cells, how many more cells do you think of viruses in and on you? If you've got a cold at the moment, you have a few billion of them every dripful of snot. But even more concern to you than this, there are endogenous retroviruses, which is a fancy term for viruses that have lodged in your DNA and they can't get out. They're part of your DNA now and you have something like 8% of your whole DNA. That's the stuff that makes you who you are or who you think you are and 8% of it is endogenous retroviruses. If we add those viruses or those parts of your DNA that have a that have a, a reverse transcriptase mo motif, it's a way of, of transcribing DNA, then something like 20% of all your DNA is made of viruses that got there in the past. It's not human DNA at all, it, except as much as we couldn't be humans without virus DNA. Meaning uh, it's never been totally redesigned and when we uh, add new functions as the brain evolves, we just put new stuff on top of the old. We have two visual systems and two auditory systems. We have an evolutionarily ancient one that we share with, for example, uh, lizards and fish. And then we have uh, an evolutionarily modern one that has come along in the mammalian lineage. And these two things operate side by side. It's as if your iPod had to have a uh, eight-track tape player attached to it. Structures that are capable of some form of light perception, and often it's not the ability to form an image, it's just light-sensitive cells, right. have evolved 40 to 60 times. I think you have a basic substrate of uh, transparent proteins that can play this role. However, the lens eye, which has evolved in six different groups of animals, in fact, though it used to be cited as a standard example, just as you said, of independent, utterly independent evolutionary events, which therefore indicate a kind of inevitability given a substrate of possibility which evolution has to give you, turns out that's not strictly true. Hmm. The eye of the squid and the human, which are so very similar, they are not entirely the same. Of course they're not. They're built of different body tissues. That part of the argument is right, but one of the most fascinating discoveries of the last 20 years is that there are shared genetic pathways. Even though these groups have been separate for more than 500 million years, there are shared mm -hmm. genetic pathways in the development of eyes in mollusks, the squid eye, in vertebrates, in insects, which have a very different kind of multiple lens eye. In fact, the squid gene and the human gene, when applied to the leg of a fly, will build a fly's eye on its leg. <laughs> <laughs> that in fact there is this enormous genetic retention of a common potentiality. It's not just convergence showing the inevitability of this higher form of perception. Oh, first of all, you have to understand why the passion is so high, and I think that goes back to a famous statement by Freud who said that the truly great revolutions are the ones that disturb our own sense of what we once arrogantly took to be our self-importance. And there have been two great revolutions. The first was uh, the Galileo and Copernicus's, and the second was Darwin's. Now we know how tumultuous the first one was. We know what happened to Galileo, but you know, that was only about real estate. That was about whether we're on the central body of the universe or peripherally somewhere. The Darwinian revolution is the big one, because that's about essence. That's about who we are and what we're related to. So that it should be so passionate is in some sense not surprising. And of course people are always looking, I think in large degree inappropriately, to science for an answer to questions that trouble them about themselves and their own species. Clearly there are many things about our behaviors and our histories that either we don't like or that puzzle us. Well, most of the mass extinctions weren't caused by asteroids from space, as the movies would show us, but rather microbial takeovers, times when oxygen has dropped, really nasty poison-emitting bacteria begin to cover over the oceans, and the subsequent emission of very poisonous hydrogen sulfide gas, five times in Earth history, has almost ended life on this planet. So we don't see any direction at all, and in fact... Uh, the only out on this planet or any planet, because we think the same sort of manifestations will happen anywhere, is intelligence. Alfin writes, 
We are beginning to see that the awesome wonder of the evolution from amoeba to man, for it is without a doubt an awesome wonder, was not the result of a mighty word from a creator, but of a combination of small, apparently insignificant processes. The structural change occurring in a molecule within a chromosome, the result of a struggle over food between two animals, the reproduction and feeding of young, such are the simple elements that together, in the course of millions of years, created the great wonder. This is nothing separate from ordinary life. The wonder is in our everyday world, if only we had the ability to see it. And of course, there is a wonderful grandeur in this view of life. Thank you.